Hey there folks, I thought I would revisit a video from eight years ago, which was AJ's top 10 tips for running a role playing game. And at the time I called this having a cup of coffee with AJ. And uh, I just wanted to see if eight years later, these top 10 tips would stand up to the test of time. And I think I did pretty well. So here we go without further ado. Number one, play the game you all want to play. Bury your ego and ask for feedback and drop unpopular stuff. I think that's pretty good advice for any game. You're playing with a group of people, your group of friends, or people that you hope to be your friends, so you don't really want to dictate everything at the table, railroad them, you know, that sort of, all those happy keywords. It's really a cooperative game amongst your friends. And sure, you're put in place of running the game and it's your job to narrate the non-player characters and to tell everybody what's going on in the world around them but it's a cooperative game where they have characters and they have a say in what goes on too after all they can always derail your game by just refusing to engage in anything that you put in front of them so it's really in everybody's best interest that you just get along and pay and play a cooperative game like you're supposed to number two cliches are there for a reason Everybody has played a cliche game of some sort in their life, or they at least know how a role-playing game is supposed to go. Um, so let's say you have a group of young apprentices and things, or ne'er-do-wells or youths of the town, and you get together and uh, you go to the local tavern and you look at, I don't know, a job board on the side and there's some help wanted for ank eggs attacking a farmstead, or there's a dark and mysterious stranger in the corner who's smoking a pipe and looking at you through eyes hidden by a hood. <laughs> this is the dark and mysterious stranger who's going to tell you about, oh, the, the local tavern has got a basement which is infested by giant rats or firebugs or something like that. These cliches exist for a reason because they make gameplay very smooth and easy. They've been tried and tested. And to some extent, this is the expectations that you have when you play these sort of role-playing games. You want to have an encounter with a horrible monster from the eldritch past in Call of Cthulhu. You want to have uh, a confusing moment where misunderstanding a machine will get your character killed in paranoia. You want to have those moments where you've negotiated some sort of deal and stolen a big load of starship fuel, which just gets you a, a jump enough away to get away from the authorities in the game of Traveller. You want to have those, you know, kick down the door, get the treasure, kill the mimic moments in Dungeons and Dragons. These are tried and tested and true methods to run a game and there's no need to reinvent the wheel every single time you play Dungeons and Dragons or any other role playing game. You can just rely on those old cliches and they'll get you through perfectly fine. And your players will thank you for it. Number three, use good ideas immediately. Now this is some of the best advice that I ever received as a dungeon master because I have a very active imagination and I was falling into the trap of holding off on my best ideas and leading the characters on the path in a railroad to get to those ideas or putting all sorts of obstacles to get in the way of the fun thing that I had planned for the adventure. And so they ended up going through boring stuff to get to the good stuff. And what I really should have been doing the entire time is just throwing the good stuff at them right from the start and just keep hammering them with the good stuff from the very start. Make your adventures breakneck speed, you know, it's constant imagination overload and when the players are starting to get overloaded and starting to yawn or disengage or they start fidgeting and they want to have a side conversation just let them let them chill out for a moment let them disengage from the game and then once they get back into it yeah you get back into it immediately and throw those good ideas at them one after the other so it's not you know the evil citadel that past the mountain range etc it's the evil citadel next door you know the orcs are raiding the town immediately the dragon attacks the place when they're at level one you know you don't have to wait until the high level player to get involved with high level monsters they, they can certainly involve themselves because they're part of the world and they should be and at level one they're oh so scary you know you don't have to have them attack the player characters you don't have to have them within range of the characters weapons it could just be they could be attacking some place that the characters are attached to and now they've got this oath of vengeance against a dragon which killed their mentor or destroyed a place where they were getting all of their adventure ideas you know like the tavern that had the notice board or the mysterious stranger got killed now what are they going to do well then the next great idea and the next great idea number four the magic words every person running a game should know are okay so now this is another good bit of advice that i got from somebody else when the 
time comes when you've given the players time to sort of chill and relax and have little side conversations and stuff. Those two words, okay, so, are a fantastic way of just getting everybody focused and back into the game. You don't have to do anything else, really. Okay, so. Okay, so let's go back to the adventure. Okay, so what's your character doing? Okay, so you've put how many of those magic items did you learn down? Right, okay, let's get back to the... So that's how you just take it back. You take back control, narrative control, as the storyteller and get everybody focused back into the game. It's that simple. Number five, let the players give you the evil ideas when they voice their worst fears. Every single player that you will ever play with, whether it's to a side conversation that they're having whispering to the other person, they will give you their worst fears, the worst scenario, the worst thing that could possibly happen in the game for the character. What are they worried about? What are they motivated to avoid? What are they paranoid that you're going to throw at them next? Listen out for those ideas and always be ready to incorporate them into your adventure. This is another reason why over planning your campaign world is a really bad idea. And this is a trap that new DMs fall into all the time. Those, those people who are narrating the game have a pre-planned idea and they or in a module or something like that and they, they feel locked into it or they've over-planned their world building so much that they don't have any room to improvise and go wildly off track based on what the characters um, you know or what the characters are doing and deciding or what the players are worried about. Listen out for those ideas and use them but don't use don't be too overt about it. just sort of slide them in there. And it will seem like you are just an intuitive genius who anticipated what they really wanted in the game after all. Number six. Even outside of combat, always go around the table and give each player time to talk. This is back to the okay so bit. And it really is a good way of avoiding any sort of personality clashes or people who just are more extroverted or introverted. It gives them equal time to have a chat and um, have their piece of time their moment in the spotlight and it's a group participation game and it's your job to arbitrate not only the combat order but also the out of combat um, conversation as well and you can be pretty subtle about it or you can be pretty overt somebody might be rabbiting on about something for 10 minutes and everybody's starting to just groan and you know disengage they're they're starting their eyelids are starting to flutter they're looking somewhere else they're looking at their phone or whatever that person is not paying any attention to what everybody else is feeling like at the table because they're deeply involved in their own narrative. It's not their fault. They're they're shining in the spotlight. They don't know that they're boring everybody to tears or everybody's disengaged. They're, they're just trying to get to the point or convey the idea. And yeah, sometimes they just go a little overboard and sometimes they're just not talking enough. And it's your job to just go around the table and give everybody time to talk. Number seven. What you give your players in the game, you can also take away just as easily. You are God in the game. You, there's no reason why you can't invent anything to correct a problem. Let's say you've given them the deck of many things. Oh, turns out there was only one real card in there. The rest of them are actually just mundane playing cards or tarot cards or something like that. Maybe the uh, sword doesn't have as many charges as the person who sold it to you thought that it had. Or maybe when you try to detect magic, the sword actually has an enchantment which um, makes it give off wrong readings. So it's not actually a plus three sword, it's a plus one sword. Whoops, don't spring that on them in the middle of combat when it can get their character killed. But, you know, edit reality as you see fit because it's your reality to create or destroy or change as you see fit because you're the narrator. That's your job. So I've kind of wonder why people think that things get away from them in the game really you have the ability to just change reality and correct things not to a completely crippling or unfair degree but just let the players know sometimes whoops uh that was i wasn't actually planning that oh that's a little bit too powerful um that actually didn't happen sorry guys number eight use the player character name during the game address the player with the character's name now i quite often get people who they tell me they don't want to talk in silly voices and they don't want to uh, put on, you know, strange NPC personalities and things like that. They just want to narrate it. But that one simple trick of just referring to the person at the table as their character name not only acknowledges their character and gets everybody else acknowledging their character, but also it's much more immersive for them as they are addressed by their character name. So they automatically think, oh, what would this character do? And 
it really really works it gets it gets very people very immersed and it's a very simple thing to do even just note that down and note down the people's character names in a little piece of paper post it on your dm screen or you know next to your computer screen and just keep in mind and just point out that um you know maybe and they may start emulating that themselves and they will actually call each other by their character name during the game which is uh really cool number nine reward role play kind of revolves back to the you know talking about each other in character when a person goes out of their way to role play their character to to present their character whether it's their voice or mannerisms or they're describing how the spell works or what sort of components they use they're being narrative they're really putting effort into describing their character's actions or what is happening in the game in a descriptive and imaginative way reward them with something tangible that they can use in the game whether it's a bonus a boon uh, special magic items um, maybe they don't have to roll a skill check they just have to narrate it and you'll say yep that's fine that's you yeah, that's a 20 you know and just let them know that role play is appreciated by you it's an investment in your game world and it's an investment in the imagination and commitment to immersion that they have put in they put in the effort you know and they need to be rewarded for that and will encourage others to do so too number 10 break the rules change the game whenever and however you need to again back to you know you can give things and you can take them away you can change the rules and you can update and modify things you can introduce house rules for even just during the session as long as you just let people know ah i like this better shall we do that and everybody nods their head bingo that's as easy as it is particularly um i've been making some videos about palladium uh, books recently and uh i'm often struck with people who naysay and say that the system is too complicated but the people who have been playing it for a long time say well once you get the general gist of it the general idea of the game mechanics and how it works you can use or ignore any of the more complex or side rules that aren't core to the game they're just there so that you've got depth of play you don't have to use all of them you don't have to use every single option that's in the dungeon master's guide either you don't have to use every single character class in the player's handbook or all of the splat books on the side you don't have to have a complete and comprehensive list of every single feat in the game for pathfinder you just you you can you can chop and change whatever you want it's your game it's your narrative it's just tools that you're using to tell a story and share a story narrative with your friends who are also engaged in it and if a player has got an alternate rule or they have a suggestion certainly listen to it take it on board if everybody agrees do it and that's about it my name is aj pickett i make videos about extraterrestrials monsters and role-playing lore thanks for listening and as per usual, I'll be back with more for you very soon.